Aloha. Aloha. It's so good to be here. I am honored to be here at BYU Hawaii, and I appreciate Brother James Ritchie and uh, the invitation to speak at this uh, to speak at this forum. I am grateful for this university, BYU Hawaii. I graduated back in 1980. Back in 1982. Let me just share with you my story, and I'll kind of build uh, from there. Uh, Served my mission in Samoa, and that is where I met. My, that is where I met my wife. Uh, I was finishing up my mission in Samoa, and toward the end of my mission, President, President Spencer W. Kimball, who was the prophet at the time, came to Samoa as a foreign area conference. And during that time, I had about four weeks left for my mission, and my sister was attending, my wife was attending with my sister, BYU Hawaii, back in the 70s, and at that time, it was Church College of Hawaii. Later on, it was BYU Hawaii. Anyways, my sister met my sister. My sister met my wife here, Peggy, and they became good friends. And she said, "I'm going to pick up my brother from his mission in February. Uh, and if you'd like, you can uh, you can come with us. And we're going to be also attending the conference in which President Kimball is going to be attending the area conference in Samoa. And so she went with my so she went with my sister and my mother to attend the area conference in Samoa. And during that week, it was my last week of my mission. Now. Growing up, this is the honest to goodness truth, I didn't ever have a girlfriend. Never had a girlfriend in high school. Never kissed a girl in high school. I kissed a girl when I was 13 because I went to a little party of 13 year olds at someone's house and they played this game called spin the bottle. I had no idea what that game was. <laughs> I gotta tell you though, 13, I really liked it. <laughs> but uh, that was the first time I ever kissed anyone. And uh, Anyways, I went through high school, I didn't date anyone, I didn't kiss anyone, and so I was really unfamiliar with girls. I was really into surfing. Surfing was my life. In fact, just to back up a little bit, I dropped out of high school when I was 15, and I uh, took off from my family, and I came here to Hawaii, and I lived right here, and this is where I spent my life until I left on my mission. Had a born-again experience here. Anyways, having said that, I was here, I was on my mission in Samoa, and I was introduced to my wife, and I gotta tell you, when I saw her for the first time, I just had something that told me there was something different about her, there was something unique about her, which was to be, of course, she was gonna be my wife. Now, in saying that, let me just say this. I really believe that those of us in this room who are single, those of us who are returned missionaries, and those of us young ladies, you have to really make sure that you're in tune with the Spirit of God during this important time of your life. Because your patriarchal blessing that states that you will be married is something you need to be working on right now spiritually. You've got to make sure that you're in tune with the Spirit so when that young lady or that young man passes, crosses your path, you have the Spirit of God knowing that that's the one. And she will know that as well. And I'm happy I was on my mission when I had that experience. So when I was introduced to her, there was something special that told me, this is it. She's the one. So I came home from my mission shortly after that, went back to California, and then she came back here to school at Hawaii. And we started writing each other. We wrote each other for February, March, April, May, June, July. She came, she came back to California. But before she came back to California, there was another girl that kind of entered my life. And she was kind of messing things up. Because I was writing my wife and we had these great letters going back and forth and we were on the phone until way, wee hours of the morning. In fact, one time we were talking to each other. I was in California, she's here in Hawaii. There's a time difference, of course, of about three or four hours. And I was in my room, I was on my bed, talking to her, talking to her and uh, I said, oh my gosh. And she said, what is that? What's wrong? And I said, the sun is coming up. And we had been talking from 11 o'clock Hawaii time until 6 o'clock in the morning California time. So we had this really deep, starting to build relationship. Then all of a sudden, this girl came into my life in California. And she started saying all these crazy things and... She was not a member of the church. But I realized then, when things get close, something like that, like eternal marriage, when you're going to be baptized, when any of these eternal ordinances, these wonderful eternal blessings start to take place in your life, the evil one will do everything he can to disrupt your life, kind of take it, take, it, take it in a different course, and that's exactly what happened. But I was so confused because this girl was telling me that she loved me and she wanted to join the church and she thought I was this incredible person. And, she got to know my family and all this was going on. And anyways, my wife, Peggy, finally came back to California in July. And when she came back in July and I saw her after I had seen her in Samoa, which was the last time I saw her, which was many months, 
Our relationship was built on letters and, and, and phone conversation. When I saw her off the plane when she came through the LA airport, I knew beyond a doubt that that was her, that she was the one, and then we were married in December. I tell you that story because of this. I have learned as I've gone through life, when anything good is coming your way, anything good, and you have no idea what that good is, it's right around the corner, it's right around here, it's just a few steps, but anything good coming your way, there will always be something to disrupt it. Unbeknownst to you, it'll throw you off, create confusion, create doubt, uh, begin to have you think, gee, is this right, or is this right, or is this wrong, or is this wrong? That's exactly what she did. So I learned from that at 21, that there have been many things like that throughout my life, that as things are good, and it's just right there, there's going to be something in my way to disrupt it or challenge me, strengthen my faith regarding it and regarding that blessing that awaits me. What happens, though, oftentimes is we fail. We fail the test. We fail the challenge. Therefore, in your life and in mine, we may not have realized the blessing that our Father in Heaven had in store for us, which was right around the corner because that thing that disrupted it, disrupted it in such a way that it threw us off track. And therefore, we never realized the blessing. So I'm grateful for that experience because it taught me that. It taught me that when great things begin to happen in your life, things that, have put there by your, things that have been put there by your Father in Heaven, there will be something in the way. Trust me, there will always be something in the way to challenge you, to try your faith and your commitment to what is truth. Just like Nephi. You know, when Nephi went after the plates, that was a commandment from our Father in Heaven directly to a prophet, his father. Why was it so difficult? Why did they have to do, why did they have to, why did they have to experience three challenging experiences in going after the plates? Why couldn't our Father in Heaven just say, hey listen, I'm going to put Laban and his, and his entire family to sleep, go there about 10 o'clock at night, walk down the hall in their home, turn right, there's a cupboard right there, open it up, there are the plates. Why was it so difficult? Because it was so great. And of course, we understand that he was, he, he was trying them and their faith and their obedience and, and their commitment to him. And of course, we understand from that experience, Laman and Lemuel failed miserably. But Nephi held on. And because of him, as we understand what his father said, thou shalt be, highly, thou shalt be favored of the Lord, which he was. So realize as you go through life, as you meet these different challenges, even though eternal marriage is great and you're going after it, there's going to be some challenges along the way to strengthen your commitment, to strengthen your belief, to strengthen your testimony and your spirit in regards to that which is right and true, which eternal marriage is. Unfortunately for some, and I know this, and I know this personally, I've had good friends and I've had family members who have, uh, you know, they fell in love and there was a, an engagement and things didn't work out. And as a result of it not working out, they became discouraged and uh, they, 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 they became weak in the faith. That happens sometimes. But don't allow that to happen. Realize because of that, you become a better person. So, here I am. I am uh, returned home from my mission in, 19, in 1976. And it's February. And I do not have a high school diploma. Here's a second lesson I learned. Dropped out of school when I was in 15, served my entire life until I went on my mission. Thought it was the, I thought it was the way to be. I still believe it's the way to be, but you've got to make some priorities. Still surf a lot as well, and I enjoy it. I have seven boys, taught every one of them how to surf. Uh, I believe in that because surfing gave me a born-again experience where I really learned to appreciate my Father in Heaven and His creation. When I was 16, I was here in Hawaii, and I paddled out to a little break out here. I wasn't going to school, so I was the only one at that break. And something unbelievably happened to me. It changed my life when I was 16. I paddled out. I was all by myself. And uh, after about an hour surfing, I caught this one wave, kicked out, paddled back to the lineup. I was the only one out there. And this is the honest to goodness truth. And God is my witness because he blessed me with this experience. As I sat there on my board, it was as though those curtains right there opened up. Like they just opened. And for the first time in my 16 years, I realized that there was a sky, and it was blue and filled with clouds. I realized there was a sun. I looked back and there was white sand and the greenery on, I was, I was, I was in awe. I was so, and I looked out at the blue ocean, and I got real emotional. 
And all of that just bore testimony to me of how great God is, that he's in my life, and he blessed me with all this wonderful beauty that I was involved with in using and, 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 and experiencing. And yet I did nothing for it. So I went home after that experience and uh, where I was staying, and I, I went right into the room, kneeled at the bed, and the prayer that I gave that, that, that morning was a prayer of thank you. I asked for nothing. It was like I had a list. I still remember that, that day very clearly. I was 16, and I was thanking my Father in Heaven for my parents, who I had taken advantage of, for my brothers and sisters, naming each one of them by name. Talked to, uh, ta to, uh, to my Father in Heaven how I appreciated my health and my strength and this wonderful blessing to serve and good friends, and I named them by name, and good leaders in the church and the Prophet Joseph Smith. That prayer was probably one of the longest prayers I had given from the time I was born to that age at 16. But it was just a prayer of thank you. When I got up off my knees, I went to my sister who I was staying with and I said, hey, uh, do you have a Book of Mormon? And she says, yeah, it's right here. I was just moved to read that book. I had never moved, I, I had never read it before. So she gave me a Book of Mormon, and I went back into that room and I started reading the book. And I went, whoa. Uh, I went back out and I said, uh, hey, Rosie, uh, here's that Book of Mormon you gave me. But uh, do you have any of those Book of Mormon for kids, the primary Book of Mormons? She goes, yeah, I got a ton of them. And so she gave me one of those books. And I finished the Book of Mormon within a couple of days. That little, that was the first Book of Mormon I read. It had a lot of, had a lot of pictures. And I uh, really enjoyed that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I had that commitment. So 16, I went back to California. I would try to get back into school. And uh, the vice president said to me, I was with my, my dad, brought me back to school. And the vice principal said to me, well, where have you been? And I said, I've been to Hawaii. And he goes, he goes what have you been doing there? And I go, well, I, I haven't been going to school. And he goes, I realize that. What have you been doing? And I said, I've been surfing all that time. And he goes, well, this school is not for you. You belong to Kurt T. Sherry, which was the school down the street where all people like me went to school. <laughs> The problem with Kurt T. Sherry, though, is that every surfer in Southern California, from Redondo Beach High to South High to my school, was at Kurt T. Sherry. That's all we did was surf. So unfortunately, I never finished school when I went to Kurt T. Sherry. It was just too fun. And the teachers didn't care whether you were there or not. It was during the 70s, during the hippie, move, during the hippie time. So everyone in my little school, there was about 150 students, high school students. Everyone was like on drugs or they were pregnant or they were surfers and they couldn't stay in school. Those were my classmates. But needless to say, I did not finish. It was just too easy to, to miss school and to go surfing. I would drive up and uh, they'd say, hey Art, it's good at Hermosa Beach or Haggerty's at PV is going off and I would just turn around and go surfing. However, I was a good kid. Went to church every Sunday, fulfilled my home teaching with my home teaching uh, companion, did all my responsibilities. But school was just really difficult during that time. Now, there's a reason why I tell you all this. Before my mission, when I went on my mission, I made a commitment I was going to go. And I had just come back from a surf trip, and I walked into my ward, and my bishop came down from the stand, and he said to me, it's time for you to prepare for your mission. I had some friends that I came back to California with from Hawaii. Uh, we were all surfers, and we were going to Mexico, and I told him, after my surf trip, when we go to Mexico, I will come to you. I'll do my paperwork for my mission. So I did that. After that month was done, I came back to him. We filled my papers out, and I went on my mission. I came here to BYU Hawaii, which was really difficult. I filled my mission, my, my mission papers in December or November of 1976, of 1975, and I came here in February of the following year. So I had just left Hawaii. And I stayed in Halle 1, 2. And Halle 2 was the MTC. That's where the Missionary Training Center was. So everything was really familiar to me. But I was very committed to the work and nothing, the surfing, and none of that uh, mattered much. The problem I had, though, was this, because of a poor choice I made. And this is lesson number two. Went to class at the MTC. And during that time, you had to memorize lessons. There were six or seven different lessons. And they all began with Mr. Brown. And we were taught during, in the day, during that time in the 1970s, that as a missionary, if you didn't memorize your, 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 missionary, your, your missionary lessons word for word, you cannot teach by the Spirit. So I was very concerned about that, having to learn those lessons word for word. It was a challenge for me, learning the Samoan language, even though I'm Samoan, but also memorizing those lessons word for word. They had a chart on the wall in our classroom, and there were 14 of us. 
And on that chart, they keep, tra they keep track of every single missionary in terms of how many lessons they had memorized or how many parts of those lessons they had memorized from the first one all the way to number six. Out of the 14 missionaries, I was the lowest one on that list. It was really challenging. This one time I memorized a page and a half and I went to pass it off that night and I could only do four, four lines. The interesting thing about that though was this, something that I learned also. That night I had a PPI with my zone leader who was the same age as myself. And, you pa and every day in the evening, you pass off what you had learned or what you had memorized. So that night, I had, a, uh, I had my PPI with my zone leader. And he said to me, how are things going? And I was extremely discouraged. And I said to him, you know, I memorized a page and a half. But all I was able to recite was four sentences. And he could see that I was really down. And I was very depressed. And then he leaned toward me and he said this. He said, Elder Hanneman, is that the best you could do? And I said to him, yes. That is the absolute best I could do at that time. I really tried hard. Then he asked me also, did you work hard? I said, yes, I did work hard for that page and a half. Then he said this to me. Heavenly Father only wants from you what you can do. If four sentences is all you memorized and passed off tonight, that's all he expects. And if you can say to him that you worked hard for those four sentences, so be it. Be happy about it. Don't be so concerned about that chart and what everyone's doing on that chart. Just be focused on you, Elder Hanneman, and what you can do. And if four sentences is it, and you really worked hard for those four sentences, so be it. Be happy about it. Then he said, because Heavenly Father is happy about that. I walked out of that room at 19, and I learned a powerful lesson from him. I don't have to be like you or be like you in your spirituality. Heavenly Father knows me. He accepts me for who I am. We both have the same testimony. He does not expect me to perform my responsibilities at your level. I am grateful for what you're able to achieve. I am. I was grateful for every one of those missionaries. What, I, what happened to me was, thou shalt not covet is what, I, is, is what I was, is what I was doing. Thou shalt not envy or be envious or covet others and what they're doing, and that's what I was doing. But I learned a very powerful message after that. After that, I didn't care where I was on that. I wasn't embarrassed by it, because I knew my Father in Heaven knew me. But the other part that I learned was this. When I came home from my mission in, in March 1976, I left in 74, I'm sorry, 76. More than anything else, I wanted to get that high school diploma. It really bothered me during my whole mission because I felt like I was the only one in my mission that did not have a high school diploma. And I, was, and I, and I carried that around with me the entire time. I had senior companions and junior companions that had already gone to BYU Provo or BYU Hawaii and had one or two years of school. And guys would always talk about their high school years, you know, and their graduation date and all this stuff and their prom. and. I never did any of that stuff. And I was always embarrassed to, if somebody were to ask me, and uh, Elder Hammond, what school did you graduate from? I'm so grateful no one asked me that question during the two years. Uh, but I was, all, I was always afraid someone was gonna ask me that question. But no one did, grateful for that. So I came home in 1976, March, having that burden with me for the past two years because of a poor choice I made. And what I learned was this, there are choices we make and there are consequences you're going to experience as a result of those choices. When I was 15, 16, 17, traveling and surfing and doing all that fun stuff and hanging out on the North Shore, I had no idea that at 19, I was going to be here in the MTC in a class to memorize six different lessons, word for word. I had no idea I was going to be memorizing this and doing this and doing this and doing that, which would have helped me if I was a good student. Then I realized because of a poor choice I made when I was 15, 16, 17, I was now paying for it. And I was dreading it, honest to goodness, every single day of my mission. I thought back of that. So March, I come home. The first thing I do, you can ask my mother, she's passed away, but if she was here, she'd tell you the same thing. I arrived on this day. The very next day, I went back to my high school and they had a, an adult continuing education school there. And I went to the principal of that school, and he, uh, we got my records, and I said, uh, 
I want to graduate, and I want to graduate June. That was March, April, May, June, in four months. It's March, and I want to graduate June. So he looked at my records, and he said to me, <coughs> you've only been, we only have records that go up to high, sophomore, 10th grade. You have to make up your junior and senior year, two years, by June. And I said to him, that's what I want to do. The reason why, because I was so burdened with this thing, I didn't want to, be, I, I didn't want to carry it anymore with me. So he said to me, it's impossible. And I said to him, is there any way that it, that, that, that it could be possible? And then he said this to me, if you, were, if you worked really, really hard, you could do it. There is a slight possibility you could do it. But you have to work really, really hard. Other than that, it's not possible. There's just no way. And I said to him, if I work really, really hard, and I give you all my work, can I graduate in June? He says, yes, you can. Now, I learned work really, really, really hard from where? Mission. I spent two years working really, really hard. I read the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. I mean, I read it all. I memorized scriptures. I had this incredible work ethic, study ethic. Every morning I was up bright and early. Whether my companions still slept or not, I was up and I was reading. I memorized my lessons. I did everything I was asked to do as far as learning, memorizing, studying, and teaching. I was unbelievable. I can say that because uh, it was like 30 years ago. <laughs> but I've never said that before. But uh, I was a good missionary. I was a very good missionary. Thank the Lord for that. But I felt the spirit of the word because of that experience I had when I was 16. And I didn't want to let him down. But my vision and my thoughts regarding education changed. And I realized the importance of it, that I couldn't go further in life if I didn't get that education. So March, April, May, June, I worked really, really hard. Up that night, I did all these different tests. I read everything they gave me. Everything they gave me, biology, I mean math, I mean all this stuff, giving me tests. Every day I was taking tests. <coughs> June, the middle of June, Torrance High School Auditorium, where I went to school, cap and gown, walking down the aisle with all my family in the audience. I graduated that day. Now, I was teaching seminary at the same time. When I came home, they made me a seminary teacher. My students did not know that I, was, that I did not graduate. So when they read off, this is really funny. When they read off, they had the, you know, they had the school band. Da, 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 playing that. Okay. Some of those kids in the school band were in my seminary class. So they read off, Arthur Hannah, da, da, da. the girl playing one of the instruments. I saw her go, her mouth dropped like, what in the world? It was the funniest thing. I knew she was going to be surprised, but uh, it was the funniest thing. But that was an incredible experience, uh, and I learned from that that choices you make at a very early age can have an effect on your life forever. And I'm so grateful that I learned from that. I went back to school. So now I'm married. I proposed to my wife, and I'm in California, and I'm going to a junior college, El Camino College. And I start up this little business having to do with roofing. And so I'm roofing on the side, and I'm doing this, and I'm going to school. I'm taking one or two classes a semester. And at 25, I was 24, and I went to my, uh, I went to get a, a temple recommend interview to go to the temple. And my, and my, my, uh, count, my, my, the counselor in our state presidency, President Roger Hendricks, who lives in uh, Salt Lake, uh, who's been involved in the CES program for years, if any of you know Roger Hendricks. He was in my state presidency. We were in Palos Verde State. And I went there for an interview, and as I sat there in the interview, after we were all done with the interview and he gave me my temple recommend, he said this to me. He goes, Brother Hanneman, Art, how are you doing with school? And I told him I'm still going to El Camino, taking a few classes, you know, and I'm, I'm doing this little roofing thing with my brother. And then he said to me, and he got real serious, he said to me, the Lord needs you to get your education. And then he said, do whatever you need to do and get it done. And that was like September or October. I left that interview and I got real serious. Went home to my wife, we prayed. And immediately I put my application in to come here to BYU Hawaii. Came here to BYU Hawaii and on the plane on United Airlines, I'm flying with my wife, my, my wife myself, and my son Spencer Hanneman, who's like maybe, maybe a year or 10 months. And on the plane, in my diary, and I meant to bring that, and I was rushing here, and I didn't bring it. 
But in my diary I wrote, I'm on this flight on United Airlines. It's 1970, uh, 1980, 1979. December 19th, it's December, whatever the date was, 1979. I'm here on United Airlines with my wife and my youngest son, Spencer, about 10 months. And I'm on my way to BYU, Hawaii. I was just accepted. I will finish in June 1982. That was my goal, to finish in two and a half years. The reason why I put that goal down is because I know me, and I know Hawaii, and I know surfing. I'm really good at all three, I'm very familiar. And I don't want to mess it up, because now I'm married and I got a kid, and there's no way I wanted to make a mistake. Because I know me back in the day, if you tell me it's up, I'm in the water. No matter what I have going on, I'll try to change things so I go in the water. If there's a swell, I'm in the water. That's how bad I was, I was terrible. It's a good kid though, just really bad when it came to surfing. You can ask my mother, I was a good boy. Uh, but anyways, I, uh, so I came here to what I, and I wrote that down and I was inspired by that. When I arrived here, I met up with a professor, Brother Brown, and I don't even remember his first name, he was here just for a semester. And I walked into his office and I said, I need to graduate in two and a half years and I need your help. My goal is June, 1982. And he told me the same thing, almost the same thing that principal did. Wow, you're going to have to really work hard. I told him, hey, I know work hard. I can do it. So we mapped it out. I have that paper too. I wish I would have brought that. I have that. We mapped every semester out from 1980 all the way to June 1982. I put graduation June. I put it at the one of the, the column there. I put graduation June. Then I went home and we lived in H170, TVA H170. That's where we lived. Love TV. And I plastered on the wall, June 1982, graduation, Art Hanneman, June 1982. See, I dropped out of high school, and I didn't want the devil to hang that around my neck the rest of my life. I finished my mission, I knew I could complete my schooling. And I finished high school, I knew I could finish my BYU. <coughs> my, 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 my schooling here. I took 16 units, I took 27 units uh, during the spring. I mean, it was unbelievable. I was called into the bishopric. I was first counselor in our bishopric with Hiram Makina, who coaches the girls' uh, team on campus basketball. He was a second counselor. My wife was a Relief Society president. I mean, it was unbelievable. I, uh, I ran for student body president because I found out that if you, if you become student body president, you get free tuition and books and all that stuff. And I said, hey, that's me. So I ran and I lost miserably. But what I learned from that experience is this. It's not always the big things that's important to achieve. A lot of times along the way, there's so many lessons to be learned. So sometimes it's not the most important thing to win the big one. Along the way, there are so many lessons to be learned. And I learned so many things along the way, but I lost miserably. But I was the ombudsman. So anyways, the guy that won was a companion of mine in the mission field. We were really close, Vaila Mutia. So that night after they announced who won and I went, oh, sh shucks, you know, and anyways, he came up to me afterwards and he goes, Art, hey, listen, tomorrow come and see me in the uh, BYU office. I have, a, I have a job for you. So I say, cool. So the following day I went in and he goes, uh, hey, you can either be vice president of this, whatever that was, or you can be the ombudsman. The ombudsman is the liaison person between the students, the administration, and whatever else is going on. And I thought, wow, that's me. I love working with people and helping people with their problems and so forth, so I'll be the ombudsman. So I became the ombudsman which was really good because I got free tuition and books and a little stipend each month, so it was really, and it was a whole year. So I was very grateful for that. I was working at PCC pushing canoes and doing trams, and I was making three ten an hour, trying to raise my family, and I thought, man, there's no way I could do that. I've got to make more money here. Here's the other way the Lord blesses you. Uh, I'll go back to this lesson, which I learned, by putting God first in your life. It was that TVA making $3.10 an hour and really struggling with that. And about a month went by, I didn't pay my tithing. Uh, pay, you know, paying rent and paying food and all that. And then after about a month and a half, not paying my tithing, I got a check from PCC. And it just so happened, this is before I was the ombudsman, it just so happened that that check, almost to the penny, equaled the amount that I owed my wife and I, that I owed in tithing. So I went to my wife and I said, hey, I have been really bad, this is what I've done, but this check right here is our tithing. We've got to pay our tithing. And she said, okay, let's do it. So we put that whole check in for our tithing, not seeing another penny for two weeks. 
So I paid our tithing and I had a can of Spam. A can of Spam and some potatoes. And maybe a little bit of rice. I took that can of Spam and I divided it up. That would last us for the next two weeks. And I made a pot of, of stew with about that much Spam that lasted us for like three days. It had a lot of flour in it with water, but a little bit of Spam, but hey, it worked. Uh, so that was Sunday, we paid our tithing. This is what I learned from this experience. Paid our tithing, felt great about it. Didn't care about the money, didn't care what was coming, just didn't care. Just felt good about that. And uh, on Monday night, after we had our spam stew, after family home evening, there was a knock on our door at TVA. I opened the door, it's my cousin Faith. And my cousin Faith says to me, Faith Thompson, she says to me, Art, Here's some bags of groceries. She had like three right there. So, oh my gosh, Faith, are you kidding me? She goes, no, no, there's more in the car. I went, whoa. So I hauled in these bags of groceries, right? And uh, she came, so she came in the house and she helped put things away. And I said, Faith, why? And she goes to me, tonight, Mommy and myself, we were having family home evening. And as we were having family home evening, at the end of our family home evening, and we just had our family home evening also, she said to me, Fadi, I'm thinking of Afa. I'm Afa in Psalm 1. Arthur is Afa in Psalm 1. I'm thinking of Afa, and my wife is Peggy, and they call her Pecky. I'm thinking of Afa and Pecky. Uh, go inside the drawer and take some money. <coughs> go to Foodland. <coughs> I was in Foodland at the time. And go buy them groceries. We had beef. We had hamburger. We had ice cream, I mean, stuff that I would never buy, she had in those bags. She must have spent over $100, $200 worth of stuff. It was amazing. But I learned from that. As you put God first always, unbelievable things happen. You don't have to worry about the how. That's the other part of this little lesson here. Sometimes we think, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to do this? How am I going to get married? How am I going to start this business? How am I going to do that? Don't be concerned about the how. Don't be consumed about it. Your father in heaven will take care of the how. Just like Nephi. When Nephi went, Nephi, they went twice on their own trying to figure this out in terms of what they were going to do, right? As far as obtaining the plates. The third time when Nephi, when Nephi went, remember that? What did Nephi say? I went not what? Not knowing. But what did he do? He just what? He just kept going. I'm just going to go. If there's a well in front of me, whatever is in front of me, I'm going. I'm going through it. I don't care. And I think what happens sometimes is we want to keep a commandment at times and we wonder how we're going to be able to, to do this, how we're going to be able to realize the result, how we're going to be able to achieve this. And what I've learned is don't be consumed with the how. Your plans don't have to be perfect. Just do something. Just get up and do it. And keep moving forward and don't stop. That's what I learned. Keep going for it. Pay your tithing and don't worry about it. Don't worry if you're going to have food or money. Don't worry about it. Even if your job is three ten an hour, don't worry about it. So I'm at peace. So about two weeks later, I find out that there's a job at Temple at the Temple to be a custodian. And so I put an application in there and I'm calling Dennis Lingley, who's over at PCC. He's, he was a supervisor at uh, the Temple during that time. I'm calling him like every other day. Is there, is, there, is there a job opening yet? Is there a job opening yet? And then a few weeks later, he says to me, Art, there is a job. We have a janitorial position open. It goes from 11 o'clock until 7 o'clock in the morning. I said, yeah, I can do it. I'm telling you this because of what I'm going to come back and tell you in terms of my schooling and all that. So now I'm working at, B at, at the temple as a janitor from 11 until 7 o'clock in the morning. And your class is at 7 or 7.30. I can't remember what time, but I always had an early class, 7 or 7.30. So I go from the temple to class, then I do all my other stuff, then I go back to the temple at night. So one night, I'm walking to the temple, and my good friend Bodhi Uwale, who's also a stake president in the Honolulu stake, and he's a judge in town. I'm walking to work one night about 10 o'clock at night, I forget what time it was, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. As I'm walking to the temple, he pulls over in his little Volkswagen. And he pulls over and goes, all right, what's up? And I go, hey, Bodhi. And he says to me, uh, you still working at the temple? I go, yes. And he goes, hey, there's a new position open at PCC. And uh, what are you making at the temple? I said, I'm making $4.10 an hour. I was making a dollar more than PCC. 
And so he goes, 4.10 an hour, he goes, hey, we'll pay you $4.25 an hour. You don't have to work at night. I go, hey, I am there. So he said to me, come see me tomorrow at PCC. So the following day, I went to PCC and uh, interviewed, and they hired me on the spot. Went back to Dennis Lingley. I said, I'm going to give you my two weeks. I found a job at PCC. It pays four twenty-five an hour, 15 cents more. The reason why I tell you this, again, as you put God first and really trust in Him, little things like this begin to take place, begin to happen. I just happened to be walking down the road going to work at the temple, and all of a sudden my friend sees me. You know, it's kind of coincidence that that happened. I don't believe it did. I believe the Lord had him drive there and me walking at that time so that we could meet at that time. These little things that happen, these little tender mercies, as Elder Bidnar spoke of in his talk, General Conference, some time ago, happens in our lives all the time. But I really believe as you're in tune, you begin to recognize these things. The unfortunate thing is, sometimes we're not in tune, and therefore they're not recognized. Like when that little girl walks your path, because you're not in tune, you don't recognize it. Now let me go back to being in tune, and then I'll finish up this story. You have to read your scriptures. You've got to do that. More importantly, the Book of Mormon. You've got to read it every day. I'm going to tell you to read three to five chapters a day in the Book of Mormon. To really feel the Spirit of God, you've got to really get into that book and study it. And I promise you, as you do, you will feel His Spirit. There's no way you can read that book and not have an ex a spiritual experience with your Father in Heaven. I find it devastating and so unfortunate that returned missionaries come home and they stop. They're walking that path and they stop and they deviate. Then I have some people tell me that they don't have time because they have an early class. You know, when people tell me, my children tell me, and I have seven boys and five are returned missionaries and I have one in the mission right now. You can ask my son Sterling. I tell them all, I give him PPIs all the time about are you reading your scriptures, are you saying your prayers? I don't care if they're 50. I'm still their dad. I'm still their dad at 50, right? Yeah. If they're 70, hopefully I'm 100 still surfing. I'm, I'm still their dad, still father. I will always be their dad, always. I am always concerned about their spirituality. So you better believe as a father, it doesn't stop because he's married, he's got a ton of kids. I'm still his dad. I'm very concerned about his spiritual welfare. So I'm always asking, are you reading? Are you reading your Book of Mormon? Do you read your Book of Mormon today? Sometimes they're a little bit irritated, but I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about them and their spirituality. And I'll tell them that too. I'll tell my kids uh, things like, are you doing this? Are you doing that? I had a PPI with my other son, my third son the other day. And I said to him, uh, I said, Seth, uh, I said, Seth, Seth, Seth. I said, Seth, uh, I'm, I'm not feeling good from you. I'm, I'm not feeling good from you. You okay with life, your spirituality? How is you and your wife? And uh, you, you, you watch anything you shouldn't be looking at on TV, any, anything you shouldn't be looking at on the internet? Are you looking at things you shouldn't be looking at? And I went into more detail. He goes, Dad, stop it. Stop it. Of course not. I'm clean. I'm good. My big thing with them is, are you clean? Are you clean? Um, geez, Sterling, where was I? Why, why, why was I sharing all this? Help me out here, son. Was that? Being in tune. Being in tune. Yeah, being in tune. Oh, yeah. Being in tune. Thank you, son. <laughs> read your scriptures every day, please. I can't tell you how important that is. Please read. Uh, again, I, I was telling you, return missionaries come home and they stop reading. I don't understand that. The most important part of your life is a part to unfold, to become a father, to have children. The most important part of your life is starting to unfold. And you stop when you really need His Spirit? Why would you do that? And then you're praying. You've got to pray every day. Pray constantly. Everything you do, pray about it. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever, even though you're not getting the answers the way you want it and as quick as you want it, continue to pray. Don't stop. Remember Nephi. I went, I went, I went, I went, I went. Don't stop. Like Laman and Lemuel, they stopped. And we see what happened to them. We know what happened to them. And the third thing, fast. I'm going to say if you're struggling with anything, whatever that might be, fast every week. Fast every single week so you can definitely feel the spirit of your Father in heaven. Fasting is a sacrifice. You're giving something up in order for you to really feel the spiritual strength you need. Physically, you become weak, but spiritually, you become strong. In the name of God, you become spiritually strong. I've experienced it so often with so many people. But if you need to fast, if you're struggling with something, fast as often as you can. It's a powerful, powerful blessing that our Father in Heaven has given us that really helps us spiritually. So, I'm here at school. I'm in the bishopric. My wife is a Relief Society president. I'm the ombudsman. I have this job going on over here, doing all these wonderful things. And through our Father in Heaven's help, I graduate in June 1982, in two and a half years, only because of Him. 
My first job was at PCC. I became a trainer. My background is organizational training and development. When I left, when I was here at PCC real quick, um, I became a trainer. We put together all kinds of training uh, manuals and, and workshops and seminars for their management group and for their employees. We did management <coughs> leadership and all that stuff way back in the day. And then uh, I went from that position, I became a manager at PCC, and then I became part of the executive group. I was an executive secretary to the executive team. And when I, became, when I was in that position at PCC, they gave me a house right across the street that President Ho Chi lives in. So when I got that position, I walked into the president's office and he says, Art, and when I walked in, the manager, uh, the, 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 the department that I was a manager of, the assistant manager was sitting in that office at PCC. And I was 28 at the time. So when I walked in, my assistant manager was in the office. He was sitting there. Steve Ashton, Elder Ashton's son was in there. He was one of the VPs. And President Rogers, he was sitting there. He was the president. So when I walked in, that was kind of the scene. And so I sat down and they said to me, uh, uh, Art, you are no longer a uh, manager of the cultural orientation department. That had about 135 employees. Had a really big budget too. And he said, uh, Osamu Ozaki, who is a good friend of mine who lives in Kanyoi, he is now the manager. And I said, okay, because we have a new position for you. So they gave me this new position. They gave me a car. They gave me the, the car keys. It comes with a car. It comes with a home. Your new home was right across the street. And it comes with an office. The office was right next to Steve Ashton. So it was cool. I had this really cool office upstairs in the administration building. And, and long story short, I had all these wonderful things going on. I was 28. And I just didn't feel good about it. I felt like I needed to go back to school to get my master's degree. So I was really confused. And uh, I told the president at PCC after being in this position for a while that I had a meeting with him. And I said, I feel like I need to leave. And I feel like I need to move on to get my higher education. And he goes, uh, and then he said to me, Art, is there any position here you want at PCC to keep you here? And I said, no, I just really believe I need to leave. So I went, so he said, pray about it. So I went home and I prayed about it. And about 4.30 in the morning, I had this incredible spirit that said, it's time to leave. That PCC was what it was, you know, to get your education. Now it's time to move on to that higher education. So I went back to him and I said, I have to leave. And so I left PCC and I went on to school in California. I started, I was accepted at USC, but the class was so crazy at USC. I transferred out, I went to University of Redlands. It was an 18 month master's program and I finished. Time is up, but I want you to know that every step of the way, what I've learned is the importance of all those things I just talked about, was the importance of making good choices, knowing that there are consequences if you don't, that you're gonna have to pay knowing to keep moving forward, that every good thing that comes about in your life, know that there's going to be a challenge right in front of you, just like Nephi. And know that those challenges are there to make you stronger, to help you become better, to help you become the person our Father in Heaven desires you to become. Realize the blessing is right around the corner. Don't give up. Keep going forward. Know always that if you put your Father in Heaven first, unbelievable blessings come your way. If I can just share three real quick things with you real fast, and I'm done in 30 seconds. As you enter the workplace and as a student, number one, always be humble. Don't ever come across that you know it all or that, you, or that you've been there, done that, heard that. Don't ever have that kind of an attitude. I've worked with people like that all the time. Always be humble. Treat things that you hear, even though you've heard it a thousand times, as if you've heard it for the first time when you hear it. Give people that kind of respect. Uh, so be humble. Learn from everyone and everything, and I promise you, if you have that spirit of humility, your Father in Heaven will teach you unbelievable things. He can't teach you if you're not humble, if you think you're too cool or you know too much. He can't teach you. Remember the words. Be thou humble, and the Lord thy God shall lead thee by the hand. He'll walk with you. Number two, be selfless. This world is not about you, and it never has been. It's about others. Remember that. Life is not about you, my friends. It's all about other people. It's what you do for others. Remember Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a saying that goes, there's no, there's no blank. There's, there's no, ugh. there's no, there's no limit to far, there's no limit to how far a man can go as long as he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Don't ever live your life, don't ever live your life that you're so hung up on who gets the credit, you're, you're, you're so focused on things and, and titles and all that junk, it means nothing. 
Remember when our Savior, when he came to this world, to the third Nephi, went to, third, to the Nephites, the only small little introduction our Father in heaven introduced him by was, Behold, this is my beloved Son. That was it. And then when he appeared to the Nephites, all he said was, I am Jesus Christ. Not your master, not your savior. I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified should come into the world. In other words, be humble, keep it simple, selfless. It's not about you, it never has been. Follow the example of your savior. It's always about other people. Live that song, have I done any good in the world today? Have I helped anyone in need? Have I cheered up the sad or made someone feel glad? If not, I have failed today. So focus on people around you. Always look for someone who is in need, someone who needs help. That's why I'm late here, because my wife helped somebody who was in need. And that's why I ran a little bit late, and I apologize for that. And number three, spirituality. Spirituality has to do with your relationship with your Father in Heaven. And your relationship with your Father in Heaven is built as a result, the time, as a result of the time you spend with Him, reading your scriptures, praying, and fasting. Your relationship with Him is built upon those kinds of things. Spirituality has to do with your relationship with Him. God bless you in all that you do. May He, our Father in Heaven, bless you as you make right choices, as you continue to move forward, that you'll realize all the wonderful blessings He has in store for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.